so now we move into the second portion of the uh, of the conference. Um, uh, we have two panels, as I as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the first panel is really uh, focusing on thinking, uh, in digging into a little bit of the nitty gritty as it relates to the intersection between policy making, uh, research, and uh, and care provision for uh, for patients with uh, opioid use disorder. So now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our uh, our panelists. Um, first, uh, Karen Stubbs Church is the Assistant Secretary for the Louisiana Department of Health uh, Office of Behavioral Health. Uh, Rebecca uh, mentioned uh, Karen as uh, one of her, uh, if not the best hire she made, and she has served as the state um, uh, head of the state Office of Behavioral Health, where she leads policy decisions addressing prevention and treatment of mental illness, substance use disorders, and addictive disorders. Our second panelist is uh, Ingveld Olsen. Ingveld is the acting director uh, at the Center for Substance uh, Abuse Treatment at SAMHSA. Uh, she has a long history of working with addiction treatment uh, within the addiction treatment field as a provider and, uh, and expanding access to care and enhancing quality. She served as the previously as the Vice President of Clinical Affairs for the Baltimore Substance Abuse Systems and Vice President for ASAM, the American Society of Addiction Medicine. And last but not least for today's panel, uh, Chinazo Cunningham. Chinazo uh, is a, the newly appointed commissioner for the state, New York State's Office of Addiction Services and Supports. Prior to that, she was Executive Deputy Commissioner of Mental Hygiene, Mental Hygiene at, in New York City uh, for the De New York City Department of Health and uh, Mental Hygiene. And before that, she was uh, a professor at Montefiore uh, in New York City. She actually still is a professor of medicine, family and social medicine and psychiatry at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. She spent more than two decades providing care delivering programs, mentoring many uh, budding researchers, and conducting research herself focused on people who use drugs. So uh, the way uh, this panel is going to go is we're going to uh, open it up to, doc, uh, to Karen Stubbs Church, who is going to uh, provide a, a brief presentation about her and her team's work in the state of Louisiana, and then we're going to go from there to uh, discuss uh, both these findings as well as uh, other topics as it relates to um, uh, this important issue. Thank you, Zach. This is Karen. Let me just do a quick sound check. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you great, Karen. Great, great. I start all my meetings off like that these days. Um, I wanna thank Dr. Gee for the kind words and also um, kind of reiterate, um, I love her lineman um, example in Louisiana that resonates. We're a big football state. And that you, you'll you hear that almost as a theme that um, we really needed someone to come in like a bulldozer and knock down all the barriers in order for those of us on the phone, the policymakers and the subject matter experts to get things done. She, she really did that for us. But the one point of clarification that I want to make is she was a linebacker on our national championship football team from three years ago, not a linebacker on LSU's current team. Um, it's a huge difference. And if you're a football fan, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so thank you, Dr. Gee. I love that, Karen. <laughs> I have a um, about a 10 slide PowerPoint. And while this wasn't the kind of the, the direction we were going to go in this uh, panel, we want it to be more discussion. The reason why I have it is because there's a couple of graphics in here that I think will really resonate with you to set the stage. And I've asked Ford Baker to share screen and run through the slides with me. Um, and let me do a confirmation is it, are the slides being shared right now? There we go. And Ford is an LCSW on my team and my right hand man on all things regulation and SUD who complements my larger SUD enhancement uh, clinicians as well. Next slide, please Ford. Um, th this next slide, slide number two, really is an overview of Louisiana, just setting the stage. And it talks a lot about how we are in a Medicaid expansion state. Um, it covers so many people in Louisiana. And this is important because Medicaid policy is the name of the game. If we do it in Medicaid in Louisiana, that hits so many people. 
and everything else kind of falls into line under that. We are also blessed because we have a pretty robust coverage of behavioral health services in Louisiana um, on the substance use side, covering all four levels of ASAM and methadone for opioid dependence. We do have an 1115 waiver, which our providers advocated for. It was really great. And it was also nice because it um, acted a little bit as a stick to some of the carrots that we were um, dangling in front of providers. Um, and so we've had a really great success and experience with that 1115. And you'll see that, that outside of regulation, we started this culture shift, the heart and mind kind of outreach that Dr. Gee referenced back in 2016, even a little before then. And you'll see in my presentation that it was a combination of many different things that got Louisiana to where they are. Next slide, please. This next slide is an image of what everyone is used to in the state. You see the sharp rise in opioid overdose. These are fatal drug overdoses as certified through our death records, um, which is where we get our information. So it's everyone, not just Medicaid enrollees. Um, blue line talks about all op opioids, um, or all drugs, and then all opioids, and then synthetic opioids. So you'll see that sharp increase that everyone saw in um, 2020. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to talk about kind of some um, areas that we, uh, different things we did to address MOU and its acceptance. We'll describe how um, the law that Louisiana passed regarding residential SUD facilities and MOUD. And then we'll be showing you slides of data from 2019 that John Hopkins research team um, did for us. And they followed by multiple aligning department initiatives to increase access and use. And um, uh, basically we, Louisiana, the Office of Behavioral Health falls under the department's umbrella, the Department of Health, and under the Department of Health, along with OBH, is our licensing section and our Medicaid section and our public health. I think this was a really amazing um, structure for us because it allowed us to align multiple initiatives and have a lot of coordination. I will say our licensing regulations, though, do not fall under OBH, um, but we do have a very close relationship with them. Um, OBH, we also um, have access to all Medicaid data. So we pull our own Medicaid data in real time every day, um, which really has broken down barriers uh, for us to make those policy decisions versus kind of getting permission from other entities, which has been really great. Um, next slide, please. So this is a reference to the actual regulation, the statute that went in, um, that was passed in the 2019 legislative session, but did not go into effect until one year ago, January, 2020. You'll see our data is actually predates this. So um, hopefully it's only good things to come uh, based on this regulation. And it was a pretty simple piece of legislation if you wanted to look it up, that's why I put it in here. And it basically requires our SUD facilities um, treating OUD to submit an attestation. It's really simple. It's really basic. Basically confirming that they uh, provide on-site access. Next slide, please. So this is a really great slide. Um, I want to take just a second because I think the visual really hits home um, for a lot of people. Each blue dot represents a residential facility, one of our larger, over 100 patients, with, SU, with treating OUD diagnosis in 2019. So each of these blue dots is a facility. The dots above the 45 degree line that you see indicate facilities that have more patients accessing MOUD after admit than before admit. So there are more people that they're serving, accessing MOUD after they've come on, um, on site. Um, a blue dot, if we had had a blue dot on the line, on the 45 degree line, it would indicate no change in the percentage of MOUD access before admit or ad, after admit. If there were a blue dot below the 45 degree line, it would mean that patients at a facility had less MOUD after admit. So you'll see universally with our larger facilities, um, everybody added more access to MOUD than before. 
I am so sorry. There's um, a child behind me. We're on quarantine yet again. So apologies for that. Um, so you can see all Louisiana facilities in 2019 were above the 45 degree line. And we're very proud of this. Um, next slide, please. The next slide is a version of this, but looking at actual patients versus facility. It focuses on patients with MOUD um, and OUD before versus after. You can see there are more actual people receiving MOUD after they check into one of our facilities. Um, the one caveat is about methadone the, to the, your very right. Methadone wasn't covered under Medicaid for OUD until January of 2020, and this data is from 2019. Um, all right, now we're going to transition into the numerous related MOUD initiatives that started that we believe contributed to this success and buy in to MOUD. Um, so let's go to, um, so here we see the first slide. You'll see back in 2014, we started an educational initiative focusing on our methadone clinics, getting them into the field and talking about this with providers and other behavioral health um, uh, uh, stakeholders. Um, we had the Matt Padoa grant, which was the first one that really focused on OTP and assisting them with coverage of patients to get a larger access to o o OTPs. Um, and then, of course, we had STR, like most states had. Um, it did a lot. We, we did a lot of um, work in, with STR around educating. Um, we did our first education with the Department of Corrections and getting into some of their facilities. And it's the first time you start to see that we leveraged peers to promote the benefits and treatments of MOUD. And then of course we have our amazing SOAR grants in Louisiana, La SOAR grant. We, we did hug and, hub and spoke models. We did Project ECHO. We did academic detailing. We did a lot of outreach into prescribers and providers in the community outside of our OTPs, our opioid treatment programs. All right, next slide, please, please forward. Um, and then, of course, we have our partnership with Medicaid, um, where we really leveraged Medicaid as a regulatory entity to help us push this message. Um, we did things like adopt HEDIS measures that were very public around this. Um, we used the initiation and engagement of alcohol and other drug abuse and dependence treatment measure. We did the follow-up after ED visits. Um, we added these as PIPs, performance improvement projects, to our managed care plan. Um, again, because Medicaid so embraced the Office of Behavioral Health and our policy direction and decisions, um, we really had our, our, our way with um, the Medicaid health plans and that population and what we're seeing treated. We got coverage of methadone um, and did some really great, um, great initiatives with Medicaid. Um, I want to point out this last bullet point. We literally pulled this data again last week and we were just like, the emails were flying about how excited we were. Um, this is based on Medicaid claims and the number of prescribers. And I wanna say, this is not people that have taken training. This is literally people who submitted a claim. We have an encounter in our Medicaid data system for this and it's increased 250%. So it's not just our work with methadone clinics and SUD residential providers. These are prescribers in the community. And we, we were clearly, you can, I was super excited about this. So next slide, please. Um, other initiatives, we have a huge HOPE Council. Um, it's like 40 people and they are big players. They're not, um, you know, uh, they're, they're all the state agencies, it's law enforcement. And that has really been a great coming together. Um, and a couple of other, we've got our 1115, We've got some other Medicaid-related policy initiatives that we believe also contributed. Next slide, please. Um, I referenced Medicaid, but I cannot leave out our Office of Public Health relationships with Office of Behavioral Health and how they, from their angle, also attacked this and did some education. They have their own grants. The most important bullet on this slide is about what we call the LODS system. Um, it's the opioid data and surveillance system. This um, allows communities to go online and look at number of deaths, number of overdoses, number of ER visits, and it's real data that can come from, you know, coroners and, and um, to one of Dr. Gee's points, 
Um, this was a nice compliment when we started reaching out to legislators or elected officials who kind of were in denial, so to speak. They said, you're not my region, not my area. And so we showed them the data. And I think the data combined with that real life experience um, after a while, they couldn't deny that it was their nephew, and then it was their neighbor, and then it was their daughter, and then they're seeing the data. It really hit home and allowed them to um, reinforce the fact that this is a problem. And next slide, please. So I um, really went quickly through these slides, but really just wanted to make sure that you saw that we are seeing success with acceptance of MOUD and utilization, which is really the important part. Um, our work is not over, um, but we believe the combination of education and buy-in, that heart and mind they have to buy in, and then topped off with regulatory sticks um, is really how we've accomplished what we've done. Um, more to be done, but we really believe um, the combination of all those has led from preventing more deaths from occurring and introducing more people to recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, uh, Karen. That was really, uh, uh, I think, really useful way to, I think, begin a discussion. Um, and I have a lot of uh, questions and insights, I think, from, uh, from your uh, presentation. It's really pretty impressive how you were able to, you know, deliver a kitchen sink, I think, approach that includes payment and regulation and education and the use of local data. Um, and I'd love to hear more about which parts were the you your department views as the most effective? But why don't we actually go right to uh, hearing from um, our other panelists because they are both have uh, where have um, really two hats or have lived in in two worlds, both as providers and now policymakers. And I uh, just want to give them an opportunity to reflect, comment, and uh, probe on what we've just learned about what you did in Louisiana. So um, I'm just going to open it up to Chinazo and Ingvald to jump in and uh, and and hear your reflections. Um, great, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so so um, I'm excited to be here and to really hear what everybody has to say. So you know I'm Chinazo Cunningham and a physician. I just started in my position overseeing um, addiction services in New York six weeks ago. So a lot of these things, so I am still in the process of learning um, and really sort of exploring how to move forward. And so I, I appreciate hearing um, you know, this history. And what I would say is in, in New York, you know, we have we're moving in the same direction basically. Um, and so um, we're really, you know, focusing on leveraging our um, regulations um, around certification and licensure to make sure that it's really focused on the quality of care, right, more than sort of the adm administrative functions that have, that have been really the focus of the past. And so, one, you know, one example of this is in our outpatient programs, um, we have regulations that require um, offering medication for opioid use disorder treatment. Um, so one of the things that we're doing right now is exploring further really in all of our programs that we license, um, you know, uh, in discussions about um, requiring offering of medication treatment for opioid use disorder. And we certainly, you know, have um, language in our regulations about not, you know, not we, that we can't, that our programs can't deny people right, access to their services based on their interests in medications or their current um, medication status. So, so for me, you know, this is something that we're actively looking at, you know, right now in terms of what do our regulations say, where do we want to go with that, how are we going to move them forward, and, and, and so um, it's exciting for me to hear about, about the work that everybody else is doing to sort of learn about um, how others have done that, and then, and then the sort of findings behind that or the implicate, you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of what happened in the real world with, with um, implementing these kinds of regulations. And um, uh, so great to be here as well. Um, uh, Ingvild Olson, I am, um, you know, I started kind of similarly, I guess, to Chinazo, but in a different, uh, on a different level, I started with uh, SAMHSA um, and particularly CSAT uh, as the acting CSAT director at the end of October. 
So I am now kind of coming up on the end of three months, um, you know, at the federal level. And, you know, prior to that, I was also very involved with um, Maryland and the state of Maryland in various different ways for many years. And, <clears throat> you know, I think um, similarly to Chinazo, um, just being excited about hearing from um, Karen and the work that's going on in Louisiana, um, you know, there are a couple of things that really struck me as, um, you know, things that have, that I was heavily involved in, in, um, in Maryland and that um, along with many, many, many other people. <laughs> and that, you know, I think that, um, uh, that whole uh, laying the groundwork that you all did in Louisiana, um, Karen, it sounds like, you know, th this was not something that kind of came about um, overnight. Um, and, you know, really getting uh, that, that buy-in, um, I think, from, you know, all the people who needed and all the systems that needed to be around the table um, so that you can really then actually uh, start to break down some of those um, misperceptions, uh, you know, misunderstandings kind of around really what the services are and what the, um, you know, uh, and come to some common understanding around what the goals are. Um, you know, I think uh, particularly when it comes to medications for opiate use disorder um, and really use marrying kind of the data and the data, um, you know, tracking uh, that is relevant to the people on the ground. Um, and so that they can really, you know, um, I think your experience with kind of using data and the narratives, um, the, the personal narratives uh, to really kind of, you know, break through some of those, um, uh, those stigmas and those myths um, is something that happened in Maryland as well and is continuing to happen. Um, because I think those some of those misperceptions and misunderstandings sometimes are hard to to kind of you know get people to to kind of shift away from um, what perhaps their understandings have been for some time. Um, but using kind of the data and and um, and using it in a way that becomes real to people, um, I think is something that also is really happening here in Maryland. Um, and then the other thing that really kind of struck me, I think, was that. Um, you know the the so the timing of kind of the regulations and the timing of you know the the sticks um, so that it's not necessarily kind of seen as also um, you know a the that um, it's seen as as something that is going to you know kind of nudge people over the perhaps like you know going back to that um, that football. Um, uh, um, scenario. It's like, you know, maybe you're not starting kind of, you know, and I'm not a football uh, connoisseur, so, <laughs> or expert by any means, but, you know, if you've kind of gotten the team some, you know, to some extent, some, to some, uh, you know, uh, line down the field, um, and then you really kind of then need this to get over that, uh, that um, the, the, uh, the end zone and into the end zone. Um, I think that, uh, that also kind of struck me as well. So, um, apologies if I really kind of butchered those football analogies. <laughs> I guess the other thing I would also just say is it's interesting in, in hearing about the structure that you sort of work within in Louisiana. So in New York State, right, our Office of Addiction Services and Support is separate, is a separate agency than our, you know, Department of Health. And so some of the things that you talked about in terms of working with really changing Medicaid or working with in terms of who has the data in terms of the overdose data, right, does not live in, in my house, in our house, in, in, in my agency. And so, you know, so part of this is not just sort of within our own agency, but then our sister agencies and working together there. And, you know, and so again, this to me is it's critical how important that is. Um, and so it's, you know, for me, it's like a different layer. And I think depending on how states are organized, right, it can become it can be more challenging or less challenging, um, de depending on that organizational structure. Um, uh, that's great. You know, uh, Karen, just thinking a little bit about um, Chinazo and uh, and Ingvald as you know as 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 learners, um, they both kicked off their uh, their comments as you know new newish to policy making specifically. And um, and uh, and I would like to dig in a little bit uh, to hear 
if you're able to share some of the implementation challenges that you may have had from providers, since I imagine that um, uh, every everyone in this sort of on this panel is going to is or is going to bump into some of those challenges, not just providers, but um, but perhaps specifically with providers, given that regulation is what we where we started. So for us, I think the biggest implementation challenge, um, if there was kind of a single point of implementation, would, would really just be the culture shift and coming from that real abstinence-based culture. And so um, instead of starting with the regulation, um, starting with that education, I think it's really, I mean, it, it makes it easier if you complement it with some payment strategies, if you complement it with some, um, not just education, but workforce. Um, strategies implementing things like Project Echo and academic detailing to some of your providers. Um, you know, one of the things I think that really helped us for this this particular piece of legislation around um, the to obtain your licensing, you have to attest that you're offering is a, a really long grace period, um, so providers aren't caught off guard with it. Um, I think those were things that really really assisted us. Um, you know. And I hate to go back to payment strategies, but we made sure that, for example, when we started reimbursing for methadone, that um, we weren't um, we weren't at the bottom uh, of the barrel with with our payment strategy. So, I think that um, maybe if I can just you know reflect a little bit on that as well. So, you know, the um, it really is that you know, and, and you know, I'm I'm seeing this now. Um, you know, also at the federal level that, you know, whether you're talking about um, a local kind of community or a state level or, you know, also at the federal level, that these multi-pronged approaches are really what is going to kind of, um, you know, uh, move progress and move uh, move the systems forward. Um, because I, you know, it, it is about, it's, you need the data, you need the, um, the buy-in, you need the people kind of around the table who also then are um, uh, all the way from the policymakers, from the regulators, from the payers, from the, the uh, you know, provider uh, community themselves. And I will say that, you know, one of the other voices that um, really helped in Maryland um, and that is now helping also you know, I think at, at all levels, whether it's, you know, states, federal level, local community level, are also the voices of people with lived experience and their family members. Um, and so having kind of that whole complement um, in a really coordinated fashion that we're, you're all driving kind of towards the same goal, um, I think is kind of one big piece. Um, I will say, you know, uh, Karen, I, I so totally agree with you that um, the, the payment structure and the, um, you know, uh, um, appropriate compensation, you know, for, for the work that um, the providers are doing, um, you know, that is, uh, that is critical because without that, you know, there is, um, uh, you know, I think for a long time, um, the behavioral health field and the SUD field in particular, you know, really has been trying to operate on a shoestring um, with, with coverage that, and, and you know, um, on the, I'm so happy to also kind of hear you talk about the block, the SOAR and, um, and the, the other grants that, um, that you get because that, that the, the pieces that are, um, that are really kind of necessary, but not necessarily sufficient come from, you know, other, uh, other places. Um, uh, and it's that kind of blending together of all of those different pieces that, you know, grants, um, uh, can support peer recovery support, uh, you know, services that perhaps aren't Medicaid reimbursable. Um, they can, you know, really support some of the um, infrastructure development and, um, you know, educational components that, um, training components that perhaps, you know, kind of um, aren't uh, really billable under Medicaid. And, um, and the last thing I would say is that um, it really, uh, I think it, it strikes me that the you know, there are many different ways of kind of also doing the stick. Um, the, you know, in Maryland accreditation became one um, kind of other lever to really try and get um, and move that quality of care that um, Janaza was also talking about forward. Um, 
but that in and of itself also is just one tool in the toolbox. And, um, and so having multiple tools, I think is also kind of what you're really speaking to. Um, great. I, I'd love to, to think a little bit from all of you uh, or hear for a little bit from all of you, how you think about disparities uh, in access to evidence-based treatment as it relates to some of these sort of more nuanced policy questions, um, particularly around um, equity and the treatment for vulnerable populations. Um, you know, I know, Chinazo, you've, um, you know, been a provider uh, of substance use disorder treatment for more than 20 years, and you've been thinking about this issue a lot. Um, and I'm wondering to what extent you think licensing or some of these other regulatory levers uh, may be able to be used to address disparities. Same thing, Karen, is this something that you and your team have thought about and been measuring and Ingveld as well? You've written a lot about stigma um, as, uh, as an addiction barrier. And while stigma isn't obviously baked into the topics of regulation and payment policy, to what extent are they overlapping. So three sort of high level question about disparities. I'd love you to guys to riff on that. Um, so I, I can I can certainly start. Um, so I look so I appreciate that this is a question and I also appreciate that some of the comments that we have heard earlier um, really about um, disparities or inequities and you know I would say racism. <laughs> Right, and so we know that this country has a history of racism when it comes to policies around substance use, and I think we have to say that out loud, right? And then think about how everything that we do, you know, will you, you know, how that you bring in an equity lens to sort of everything that we do. So you know, in attempts to sort of mitigate um, that that history and that that existence, and so. Um, so I, you know, for me, when, you know, coming and taking my position at, at New York State, I mean, that, you know, I'm leading with that. And a lot of the, um, you know, work that I'm doing is saying we have to take an equity approach to all of the work that's done that needs to be woven into our discussions about everything that we do. And I really, you know, believe that, you know, sort of to the core. Um, so, you know, can can we address this from sort of a licensing or regulatory, you know, aspect? Um, I think certainly it can be an effective tool, um, but, you know, we're going to need, as, as, as we've heard, already heard, like many other tools as well. Um, and so, you know, some of the things, so in addition, you know, trying to really level the playing field by, you know, so requiring or, you know, not allowing discrimination based on medications, requiring medications offered to everybody, not just certain kinds of people, right, that this is baked into the policies will help with that. But I think um, some other things to that really that we are, you know, in, in discussion about include um, access in pharmacies, right, using pharmacies, we know that pharmacies are much more available than, um, you know, treatment service, you know, than addiction providers mm -hmm. or medical providers, in, you know, period. So can we leverage pharmacies in terms of making sure that they have naloxone available and medications to treat, you know, substance use disorders like buprenorphine? Um, so that's something that we're, you know, we, we have legislation, but can we push it even further, right? Um, you know, I think, um, we're also very interested in looking at other parts of the system, not just what happens in, um, you know, drug treatment programs, right? So what happens in emergency rooms, what happens in hospitals, what happens in primary care settings? And again, working with our sister agencies, for, for me, the Department of Health, right, that's not in my age, we're separate agencies to say, how can we work together? And we're, act, you know, actively doing that now to see, to make sure that there's no wrong door, right? That that regardless of where people come in the system, that they have access to evidence-based um, treatment, right? So um, the other thing, you know, that I think we have to be very sort of um, is is a double-edged sword. I think it's great, but we have to keep our eyes on is telehealth, right? And these. So telehealth during the COVID pandemic has been wonderful as, you know, one way to sort of, again, potentially expand treatments to, to access populations that have not been able to access 
um, substance use disorder treatment. At the same time, not everybody has access to you know, devices, not everybody has access to the internet. Um, and you know, this is something I just, we looked at in my own clinic before I, I, I came to the state and found sort of not surprising that there was a bit of a shift in the demographics from who we were serving during the COVID pandemic than before. And it became a little bit more affluent and a little bit more white during the, you know, during the pandemic where we were providing treatment with telehealth. So that's like a flag to me to make sure that again, all the things that we move forward, that we have an equity lens and we're paying attention to what happens when we roll out this new, you know, strategy. Um, what are the potential, you know, unintended consequences here? Um, so, so, you know, I, again, think there's a lot of things that we, we could do to try and reduce, um, the inequities and and really just as again as a as a as a paradigm shift as a cultural shift really in all the work that we do bring an equity lens to that. That's very very fascinating thinking about um, you know stuff like telehealth which we think of as a, a potential low barrier or low. We could lower the barriers, but has these unintended consequences that we need to pay attention to. Um, Ingvald, I don't know if you have thoughts about. Uh, yeah. Um, no. I, uh, thank you so much for that, Chinazo. I, you know, I think that um, I also go back to what you mentioned about, um, you know, uh, and, and what Karen has talked about in terms of the data, um, you know, and really being very intentional about um, how what we're measuring um, and that, um, that we're really paying attention to kind of uh, those elements through an equity lens. Um, because we'll only see, you know, kind of also those, uh, those disparities and those health disparities um, if we measure it that way. Um, and, you know, I think um, at the federal level at SAMHSA, um, you know, uh, there is Dr. Delphine Rittman as the assistant secretary um, has really baked in equity as one of um, her cross-cutting principles across all the work um, that SAMHSA is really doing. Um, and, you know, across federal government that also, um, you know, is now a, a very big priority. And so, um, you know, in everything that we kind of do uh, to make sure that we're not only, um, you know, really paying attention to um, what we know um, in terms of kind of health disparities, but then also that we're measuring it. And so that we can then Make sure that we are um, making progress towards reducing that. And you know, I think you asked um, Zach about you know stigma, um, uh, you know, and uh, and how that might play a role in this. I, you know, I would also be interested to um, to to hear what Karen kind of has to you know Anton and Nazo have to say about this because I think one of the things just in my experience and and when you look at surveys after survey after survey. Um, you know, whether it's among the public or particularly healthcare professionals, you know, stigma is one of those um, drivers that, um, you know, keep, uh, it's a huge barrier, um, you know, and, and various different, um, you know, layers of stigma, kind of whether it's in and, and stigma as, dem as um, uh, really, uh, operationalized kind of, for lack of a better word, as discrimination. And so, um, you know, uh, really making sure that we have policies, whether they're, you know, kind of um, regulatory policies, payment policies, um, uh, you know, uh, um, local zoning policies, uh, you know, there's a whole set of, of I think, kind of um, areas where we just really need to be measuring kind of um, what we're doing and understanding kind of where those um, inequities uh, are playing out and um, and then um, understanding that stigma as uh, you know as discrimination is something that we need to address and that the the discrimination kind of stigma um, uh, for many people and for many communities isn't um, isn't also uh, um, doesn't carry necessarily the same exact same weight because there are multiple sources of stigma. So when you have people who um, you know, are people of color, communities of color, um, in addition to the stigma of um, addiction, uh, stigma against medications for opiate use disorder, 
you know, stigma, um, kind of, you know, uh, racism, stigma around, um, you know, poverty, um, you know, gender orientation, uh, or, you know, sexual orientation, kind of gender identity, you know, all of those things, kind of that, um, that, uh, that intersectionality of all of those um, also is something that we really need to be paying attention to. So, um, uh, yeah, so, so I think that the, the stigma really does play out in many different ways. And, um, and uh, we just need to be aware of that as well. Great. Karen, I, I don't know if you have thoughts of, about this, particularly as it relates to, you know, structural racism or, and, and, and inequities. Um, and, and I'm particularly interested in, uh, in, in the newish uh, Medicaid coverage of methadone in your state and what, what, how that might play in and what your expectations are. Yeah, so I mean, we were really excited to get Medicaid a uh, methadone covered. It took us a few times before it went through, and um, it was a really big celebration. But I think you know, there is that that stigma, and as you, my panelists pointed out, it, it comes from many different ways. And so, not just doing kind of a blanket stigma campaign, um, but kind of targeting locations, targeting groups. We did a whole faith based initiative with a toolkit educating our faith based community about utilization of MOUD and harm reduction. Um, and these weren't campaigns directed at people who might need the services, but instead their neighbors and their families and their faith-based organizations. Um, we also have been very purposeful in utilizing our grant money to address some of these um, barriers that um, really have their roots in these equity issues. Um, to complement what we already have Medicaid paying for. So things like with our methadone clinics, particularly um, it is a Medicaid covered service. And then we use some of our grant money to cover up to three or 400% of the poverty level on, on top of Medicaid. And, in, and as a condition to um, accept the LASOR, the SOAR money, you have to first check Medicaid coverage. And if not, I mean, our pop, we're looking, I think it was like 350 or 400 percent like of the poverty level. So um, really kind of layering on um, uh, those, those grants and opportunities so no one is left out. Um, things like looking at our methadone clinics and transportation is a huge issue. Um, and of course, we've got Medicaid in EMT, non-emergency medical transportation. It's not really set up for a daily dose at 5 a.m. where the purpose is to get there, get it and get to your job, not wait for two hours until they circle back around. And so looking at some of our um, money to see how we can supplement, not use it in lieu of Medicaid, but how can we add it on top um, of something that Medicaid doesn't cover um, to see a full complement of a system are, are things that we're doing. Great. Um, now might be a good time to go to the uh, Q&A box. There's uh, a question about um, X waiver requirements, which may have a little bit of less, po less acute policy relevance given that those are changing. But um, I think it's a great question as it relates to uh, these types of requirements and disparities. Um, so the question is, particularly for nurse practitioners who are often more likely to be the primary care provider for Medicaid insured patients, uh, depending on the state, even if an, a NAS practitioner is X, X waiver, they may not be permitted to prescribe buprenorphine uh, if their supervising physician is not X waivered at all. Um, so I don't know uh, if this is something that uh, any of you guys have thought about. I would be interested in hearing uh, not just about this type of requirement, but others that actually potentially could worsen disparities and how you keep an eye out for them. So I'll go ahead and um, kind of start. I think one of the things we focused really hard on in growing those prescribers is um, giving them additional resources. So again, adding on top of a system. So you, you can go and get trained and, you know, relatively it, it's not um, a huge burden or extremely difficult, but then you don't feel comfortable treating um, patients that maybe, um, you know, would require a little more time or, or a little more of a complicated case. And so 
um, making sure, sure we've surrounded our prescribers and the agencies or facilities they work with, with um, those supports that might be just what they need. So getting them kind of a, um, a care team based out of our LSU Health Science Center to help staff um, more intense cases or more complex cases, um, doing connecting them with peers through Project ECHO and academic detailing, where if they're hesitant to take a case because they just haven't done it very often, um, then they can have some peers in another part of the state uh, to help guide them through it or to bounce ideas off of and, and really just getting that support that is outside of the basic, you can bill Medicaid for it, you know, but Medicaid isn't going to pay necessarily for that lunchtime education that we provide through Zoom, um, you know, once every couple of months or finding them a counterpart in, in New Orleans who is pretty used to doing this and they're in rural North Louisiana and it's very new and uncomfortable for them and kind of partnering them. I mean, I, I definitely agree. I mean, you know, obviously the X waiver is the first step, but what is, you know, as we know, at least in New York, that half the people get their X waiver and never do anything with it. And then, right, so they need that additional support. I think um, just to pivot a little bit in terms of thinking about other ways to really address inequities for us, one thing I'm like very proud of in New York is our governor recently signed into law um, a bill that mandates medication treatment in jails and prisons throughout the state. So this, to me, is going to be critical. So not all, you know, and so we know it, it, you know, really targets some of the people who are at the highest risk of overdose death, but then also people who, people of color, right? Because we know, you know, as, you know, I sort of stated, we know this historically, you know, we've had such racist policies about who ends up in jail in, you know, incarcerated because of drug related offenses, right? They're black and brown people. And so now for us, we're, we're in the process of figuring out how to implement this law that requires all three types of medication treatment for opioid use disorder in jails and prisons across New York state. Um, I think this is a game changer. Um, you know, there's still federal um, issues we'll have to work through. So I, I look forward to partnering with you in build about this. Um, but but I think like, the, you know, these are sort of the, I mean, these are the bold things that we need, frankly, right? Um, it's so, so um, you know, so that's just like one example of, of something that we're actively working on and I'm really excited about. I might also just, you know, add that I think to the original question, you know, part of um, what has changed really, uh, you know, in the last year is that while the, um, the notification um, to obtain an X waiver and actually like having the X waiver itself um, is still, uh, you know, part of the, the federal um, regulatory and kind of a, and um, legislative framework for, um, uh, for buprenorphine prescribing uh, for the treatment of opioid use disorder, that um, the that that training, you know, I think that Karen kind of mentioned, um, is not is no longer tied to that uh, that X waiver um, for you know physicians, nurse practitioners, kind of physicians assistants, um, other eligible prescribers who wish to prescribe up to thirty patients um, or less, and I will say that. You know, I think what we have seen um, uh, with some of the data that has also been released from SAMHSA is that that has, um, you know, resulted um, in uh, in a larger um, number of practitioners now becoming um, X waivered, um, particularly in uh, um, you know kind of across the board, but particularly also with physicians. Um, and uh, I would say that, you know, the the educational kind of training, um, you know, that uh, that has been provided and that continues to be provided, um, you know, is is an important kind of piece, um, you know, for to, I think what Karen mentioned in terms of, you know, helping people who um, have the waiver feel comfortable to use it. Um, you know, I think uh, how kind of the federal government really is going to look at all of that um, you know, and, and where we're going to land kind of eventually um, in that system is still something that, you know, kind of, I think we're all 
kind of really grappling with. Um, and uh, I will say though that, um, you know, going back to kind of the stigma question, you know, I, I would also kind of wonder um, that, uh, you know, if there are, if there is a supervising physician, um, you know, in states where, for example, you know, nurse practitioners are not independent practitioners um, and need to have that supervisory um, physician. You know, the question I would also ask is kind of now what is keeping that physician from, or any physician, you know, kind of from really taking advantage of that new, um, uh, that new policy um, because, uh, you know, the, the training requirement, um, you know, for up to 30 patients um, isn't really no longer a training requirement. Um, uh, so, you know, um, that, that might be, a, you know, reflecting it back onto the, the physician because it may be uh, something different. There may be a different barrier there um, that, uh, that isn't just, you know, kind of as clear. Um, I'd like to uh, hear uh, any of you think a little bit or reflect on, um, you know, uh, uh, on, on some questions related to potentially sort of efficiency, cost effectiveness. You know, Karen, you really um, uh, shared with us a multi pronged strategy that uh, probably some of those interventions were, were more expensive. I could imagine the academic detailing. Uh, was probably not not cheap. Um, uh, and how do you think about that? Um, particularly uh, all of you, and now that you have are wearing um, policymaker hats, to what extent is that important? How do you go bold, as um, as uh, Chinazo said, um, when you have budgetary constraints, and um, and what's when does the sort of bang for the buck matter? versus just doing the right thing. So, so I agree from our perspective, um, they are expensive and we could not have done everything we've done without the benefit of the federal grants, um, you know, starting Matt Padot and STR, but we love our sores, you know, and it seems like they just kept coming with more leniency as well with what we can do, which was great because our um, very clear, Step, our steps were clear when we first started receiving the grants. Initially, there were some really basics you had to get out of the way. Let's let's address some training. Let's address stigma. But now we've come so far, we're able to use that money to kind of really get into the weeds and do things that are very specific, like Project Echo and those academic detailing that, quite frankly, we just never would have been able to find the funds to do um, uh, without it. And I mean, I think that, oh, go ahead. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think that that, uh, to some extent, is kind of music to my ears as a, um, you know, in my current role, um, because I think that's also the intent of, um, you know, of the SOAR program, of, um, you know, many of the grant programs that, that SAMHSA and CSAT specifically fund is, is to really be able to, um, you know, complement um, the system, really be able to, you know, at the state level, um, have uh, states have um, you know the flexibility to really be able to actually identify you know their own needs um, where the gaps are um, in their systems um, and then you know be able to to uh, uh, fill those you know obviously with also then some guardrails and parameters kind of around um, you know from the federal government in terms of um, you know uh, what um, what large buckets kind of, of, um, of services and of, you know, the whole kind of continuum from prevention, harm reduction, treatment and recovery supports um, and uh, workforce development, those types of, um, you know, pieces that, uh, that Karen is mentioning. Um, you know, it also is really exciting for me to kind of hear how it gets implemented kind of on the ground, um, you know, because that's not necessarily something that, uh, that we hear, you know, kind of, um, uh, it, it's kind of an iterative process, I think, um, you know, kind of between um, between the federal government and um, and states, and you know, and all the grantees, kind of that we have um, uh, in various different communities across the country. Um, so, so I think that that um, you know, being able to to kind of have some of that flexibility and um, and also then coordinate, you know, kind of what um, what makes uh, what makes sense, kind of given the 
um, the the the, uh, the parameters and the and the guidelines, the the authorities and the you know kind of um, congressional intent also kind of that uh, that um, that came comes along with these programs. Um, but I think the 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 training pieces um, that the SOAR grants and other grants can be used for I think is a um, uh, is a really um, an important component. So thank you, Karen. I would just echo that, you know, what, what I've heard from my colleagues is this, um, you know, it's sea change, right, between like the, the dollar amount, the resources that we've had as an agency and that we now have. And that, that really allows us to really think, again, like in a big way that, that I think was challenging to do before. And so, you know, for us, I think a lot of what we're able to really think about how to use, you know, all of the supplemental block grant money is to really think, you know, big about like, can we create new ways to deliver care to really bring care to where people are, um, or to sort of expand services. So like open access services, or like, you know, bringing mobile units to parts of the state that don't have um, services. And can we do that while then working on ways to make it sustainable through billing and through, you know, through Medicaid. And so, so this gives us that time, right, to sort of like, let's figure out what that should look like. Let's, you know, have it implemented on the ground so we can start it up as we're at the same time figuring out, okay, so then in two years from now, how are we going to make that sustainable? The billing codes or new, you know, ways to sort of, um, you know, have that funded um, and, you know, that makes it sustainable. So I think it really, um, is this, you know, I, I feel like unprecedented opportunity uh, in, in probably decades. Um, and at least for me, I'm super excited to be at this, you know, at sort of at this point um, here with the, with the, where we are with the overdose epidemic to really say like, let's, you know, there, there's sort of like nothing we can't do, right? That like, let's, you know, now we have these resources and can, we can really think innovatively with our stakeholders, um, you know, and um, do things that I just think, frankly, were not really possible before. Um, so it, it really feels like, again, an exciting time. It's, it's a shift to see, you know, a sea change, a change in the paradigm. Um, and, you know, I mean, that's really what also drew me in to, to, to now to do this work. And so I'm, I'm very excited by, by all of the possibilities. I want to add, I agree, it's allowed us to, and I hate this word, but almost pilot in a sense, a couple of ideas where we can get it done quickly before we go through the 18 month long process of, um, you know, doing rate development for Medicaid and going through our, to our legislative session and then doing our spa or, or whatever that might be. There's a few things like we're, we're dipping our feet into 24 seven methadone clinics, but the Medicaid rate doesn't consider certain costs that would be required for a 24 hour a day facility. And so let, let's do that. Let's look at the data. And then it makes my job easier because I then have data ready for when I have to go to the Capitol and advocate for this because I've been able to experiment with it. Um, I want to go back, uh, uh, drive back to the, um, the, the draft sort of regulatory language um, that um, we shared with all of the participants in the um, conference as email. It's also the link in the chat at the top of the chat that you can all access. Um, uh, but you know, Chinazo and uh, Ch Chinazo and uh, Ingvald, you were part of uh, the expert panel that helped us think about some of this language. Karen, you've obviously implemented, you and your team have implemented some language uh, or some regulation focusing on licensure. And, uh, and um, I'd like to just step back for a second and think about uh, sort of this blend of carrots and sticks that we've been hearing about um, uh, today. And to what extent um, does, uh, has your perspective evolved or changed? Um, and, uh, and again, are we, um, thinking about uh, to what extent, I guess, um, particularly with Chinazo and Ingvald, who uh, have had both 
provider and now policy making experience, are there things that you are worried about uh, now as policy, as sort of in, in your current roles that you weren't worried about as providers or vice versa? Um, is it uh, that, that we recognize that there are, um, the use providers are important stakeholders and when we think about regulation, um, but then of course, when we get into the regulatory arena, um, things often look different or feel different than they may have when you're actually um, on the ground seeing patients. And I was just hoping that you might be able to reflect on sort of that transition um, and, and, and how has it changed your, your thinking about ideas like licensure. Um, I, I can start. So, um, you know, I, I spent uh, 22 years as a provider in the Bronx and um, really uh, didn't have a full appreciation of what it means to uh, create policies. And so I think, you know, when I, I go back and I look at some of my comments, I think they're, they're uh, very much in the advocacy realm, advocating for my patients in the communities that I was serving. Um, but in a lot of ways, maybe quite naive when it comes to policies. Um, and so I, I would say that I still very much feel um, that, that the same issues as a provider are still issues here as a, as a policymaker in terms of ensuring equity, expanding access to evidence-based treatment, using our data to guide and push us, right? Um, but I think for me, it's it's humbling to sort of understand much more of the nuances about how to get that done, and you know how challenging it is. And so with, with you know the different levels of the local community, state, and federal government, and having and you know and then partnering within within those units and across those units, right, to really um, make the kind of impact that I think is necessary. It's just you know it's it's much more challenging. Um, so I think that that wasn't uh, so clear to me as a provider, sort of with the boots on the ground, and now it's 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 much more clear. And and I have to say that like you know I think that um, just really in the last year there's been a lot of changes in who's in some of these leadership positions, and and um, and again to 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 really um, allow for us to sort of work together and make these kinds of changes. And so I think it's very heartening and really hopeful um, where I think sort of previously, um, I, you know, I think there were a lot of, I mean, I've, I'm hearing from sort of my colleagues that this, these were just things that were not possible, that like it was sort of like non-starters mm -hmm. um, in a lot of ways. And so that these conversations that we're having now and exploring, you know, various avenues, I think there's a lot more hope um, now than maybe in the past. And so, so that's, that's wonderful to hear. Um, but I also just, you know, it's, it's been a humbling ex experience for me just to really appreciate, um, you know, the challenges that, that, that there are, that, that you know, it's, it's just not so apparent as a, as a practicing provider on the ground. And um, I would, you know, kind of also echo, I think, the Chinazo's observation that, you know, um, translating, um, I mean, I've, I've been a provider for, you know, 20 plus years as well. And have also been involved in various different kind of aspects of policy making. I think kind of you know for some time, and um, I think uh, you know I um, I realized you know uh, at some point I think also that um, you know the we need all the various different kind of pieces. So we need the we need the advocates. We need the um, you know the policymakers. We need the you know all the various different voices. Um, to really move the system forward in, um, in a thoughtful way as well. Um, and I think that's really becoming incredibly clear to me kind of now um, also going to the federal level where, you know, um, Janazo and, and Karen have so, uh, you know, um, very clearly uh, identified that, you know, even within a state and even within, you know, kind of to some extent a local community, that you know, there are different. Um, there are different groups of people. There are different needs. There are different um, levels of understanding. Um, you know, kind of of what it is that uh, that um, that uh, you know we're trying to do. Kind of what it is um, that uh, you know is is evidence based, for example, um, and and that you know you really do um, what 
in one, um, I mean, I, I am still seeing patients kind of, um, as, you know, aside from my, um, apart from kind of my, my federal duties, um, you know, and I think one of the things that I've found is that that experience and those individual experiences are really incredibly helpful to, um, to identify what the issues are and what the barriers are that people are kind of running into. Um, and that when you get enough of those kind of stories um, and you get enough of that kind of collective, you know, uh, want to tear your hair out, <laughs> that, uh, you know, at that point, you know, really also being able to kind of, um, you know, ha connect that to how, what are the policies? What do they look like? How are they working? Um, and then, you know, how does that then, how do they perhaps kind of need to change um, at some point? And then how does that actually kind of get reflected back on the ground? Um, and so that kind of court, that connection, I think kind of has been really helpful for me, um, you know, in my career. I will say the other thing I, um, I think is that, you know, policymaking um, and whether it is kind of through licensing or any other kind of regulatory, uh, you know, kind of piece that it is really incremental. Um, and it kind of, uh, I think by the nature of really wanting to, 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 you know, factor in kind of all of those different um, uh, voices and um, different, you know, needs and different resources, uh, you know, of kind of a whole, whether of a, a very large kind of population of people, um, so that we aren't, you know, kind of leaving people out. Um, and uh, yet we're also kind of doing it in a thoughtful way so that, um, that we are, you know, kind of trying to, um, trying to move people along with us, <laughs> I think as well. And, um, and that, that, um, that really does, you know, kind of, it, it takes time. Um, and I think it, you know, it takes kind of an incremental, um, you know, incremental steps. Um, understanding also that as Chanazo said that, you know, sometimes we also really have to think big and bold. Um, and, you know, I kind of liken it to, um, there's a, um, you know, you start, when you negotiate, you kind of start high and then you like, <laughs> you know, you kind of um, work, your, work your way kind of towards uh, something that, you know, maybe isn't exactly where you want it to start out, but you can kind of get the, that ball moving forward, um, you know, down the field. And, um, and I, I think it is really important to, um, to be able to articulate kind of that. And Karen, you know, you really have done that so well with, um, you know, with the work in Louisiana is to articulate kind of where are we going um, and where do we kind of really want to get and have that common understanding and common ground of, you know, kind of this is, we're all kind of in this together. Um, how, we, how we get there, um, I think is then kind of, you know, where we have to do kind of that negotiation and that work of, you know, really um, making that, that, uh, that incremental um, yet really necessary change. And, and sometimes you have to kind of put the big, bold ideas on the table um, and, and then, you know, kind of, and then start to, to kind of hash, hash that out. So, and I think that we've kind of seen that, um, you know, uh, in the, the last year and in the, the new HHS um, overdose prevention strategy, um, you know, that really has now kind of folded in um, harm reduction, you know, has the four pillars of prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery supports, um, you know, is being open to kind of new ideas and new ways of kind of thinking about how do we get to that, um, that common goal of really preventing overdoses and preventing the loss of, you know, additional lives, um, because we've lost just way too many people. Um, and uh, I think the, you know, really now kind of trying to think about from a regulatory standpoint, um, as well as, you know, kind of with licensure and with all the different things that we're talking about, you know, how do we then kind of, you know, get to that point and keep moving it forward? Um, awesome. Uh, great. So we're, I think, you know, getting close to uh, the end of our panel. I, I, I'll take the prerogative to ask a, a, a wrap up question that maybe you can, if you're able to answer in 30 seconds uh, each or uh, a minute, 
uh, that would be great. And it really is just building on what I'm hearing here, which is how can we be, be how can we go bold and think big with all the additional resources and um, energy that exists now while still being incremental and pragmatic. If there's one or uh, maybe one or two things that you want to do now, uh, each of you as your uh, or you or your agency or group um, is planning to do that would take this ball and move it the next step forward, uh, what would it be or what is it? I'll start, I'll, I'll start with you, Karen. Um, so the question is, what, what's next? our next big thing in our plan, yes. our next step? Yes. So I can tell you what we're doing now. We're very excited. Um, Louisiana hasn't increased the number of methadone clinics we've had in, I mean, at least a dozen years. We've been pretty stagnant. And, um, and we are in the middle of doing that. We're, we've got a plan. And I think that's the, the key is to have a big, bold plan. And then at, as uh, we've talked about, we're incrementally getting and building those. And so um, we are very excited that that because it, I was just surprised Louisiana to begin with had 10 methadone clinics, but it's only 10 in the whole state. And so you'll see us hopefully um, very soon start to, to open new locations. Great. Which is a big deal in Louisiana, a really big deal. So <laughs> um, it's, hard, I, it's hard to say one thing. So, I mean, I, I would just say um, we, we, really uh, need to focus on um, having an equity lens to everything that we're doing and um, incorporating harm reduction into sort of our all existing services and then expanding harm reduction services. Um, but I think just sort of, uh, you know, if I had if I had to say one thing in, in terms of also thinking about your earlier comment about sort of the cost effectiveness, um, and I'm going to use that term very loosely and not like <laughs> economist. Um, but you know, I just think I can't ignore the data about medication treatment reducing mortality by 50%. There's not much else we have in the healthcare industry that ha can really have those kind of, that kind of impact. So I mean, you know, and Karen mentioned expanding medication treatment. So you know, having this be the the expectation and the regulations across the board, um, and then and figuring out ways to expand that so ways of like mobile medication for methadone expanding meth you know so so i just think more medication to people who need it and all of the ways to be able to do that through regulations and through sort of innovative ways to get medication to people is really for, for me a driving force and i think i um you know uh at samsa and at csat in particular we also are um uh, you know, uh, have kind of in the last, um, you know, under COVID. I mean, I think COVID, we haven't really talked about that, but but I do think that COVID has kind of been a, um, uh, for all of its, you know, it, it, tragedies, um, it also really has allowed the system and allowed all of us to really kind of think differently. Um, and, uh, and certainly, you know, all the regulatory kind of flexibilities that came out of the federal government between SAMHSA um, and the DEA to really um, set the stage for allowing what Chinazo and Karen are talking about, um, you know, new service delivery methods, telehealth, um, uh, you know, really thinking about flexibilities for methadone take-home um, dosing, you know, all of those things um, were just huge. And, um, you know, the fact that we actually kind of were able to take advantage in some ways of this really horrible tragedy of COVID, um, I think is teaching us some lessons that, um, that we would have we'd spent, you know, 40 years kind of under <laughs> a regulatory framework that, um, that really didn't allow us to do that in, in such a big, bold way. So, um, you know, SAMHSA is really um, uh, looking and exploring at ways of making those flexibilities permanent. Um, you know, and uh, I think that's, um, you know, we've kind of extended the, um, obviously the, um, the telehealth uh, or the, rather the methadone flexibilities kind of, you know, at least for the, the a year past the, um, the ongoing kind of COVID public health emergency, um, you know, the DEA changed their regulations around mobile um, me medication and non-mobile medication units last summer. 
Um, and so, you know, now SOAR grants and um, uh, can be used to um, help uh, defray the costs, you know, and support kind of the, the, um, the, the implementation of that. Um, and, uh, you know, CSAT also kind of came out with some um, regulatory language around kind of what, what that might look like, what those services might look like. Um, and so I think we're, you know, this is, I, I agree with Chinazo. It's really, it's, it's an exciting time to kind of be in this field despite all the tragedies. And I think we, we, um, we can use those, um, uh, that the data, we can use kind of the, um, these really terrible situations to kind of really push us um, in some ways, big and bold, perhaps that we haven't been able to do in the past. Okay, that was just awesome. Uh, thank you, uh, all of you, for uh, your participation, insightful reflections, comments, and we are going to just roll right into our uh, next sessions.